Hey guys, what's going on? It is Chris here. Now today I'm going to be going over the uh, first slides for our second general body meeting uh, on the PC parts. I meant to record this meeting, but uh, the, the recording actually had some issues. So after looking at it, after the meeting, I decided it would be better for me to just basically uh, go over everything again and record it and post it for you guys. Uh, that way, you know, anybody who was unable to show up to the meeting can still have all the information we talked about. So uh, we're going to start off. The first thing that I want to mention is just the eight basic parts, uh, hardware-wise, of building a computer. This doesn't include an OS. But uh, first, you're going to have your CPU. You're going to have your CPU cooler, your motherboard, your memory or RAM, your storage, your video card, uh, also sometimes referred to as the GPU, although there is a difference. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, your case and your power supply. So we're going to dive into each one of these parts a little bit deeper so that you guys can know like what to actually look for uh, when you're building a parts list for a PC. So first we've got the CPU. Uh, everybody refers to this as the quote-unquote central processing unit and a lot of people will compare this to the brain of the computer. Uh, something that you want to look for when you're choosing your CPU. You want to look at the core and thread, uh, the core count and the thread count, the uh, architecture which goes into the instructions per cycle which is also called instructions per clock by some people. Uh, the frequency, or, or sometimes called the speed, uh, you want to look at its overclockability, and that also has to do with the voltage that it's going to be running at, and also maybe you want to look at whether or not it's an APU. Uh, for those of you who don't know what an APU is, APU stands for accelerating accelerated processing unit. Uh, it's basically a CPU with somewhat decent uh, onboard graphics. Uh, it's meant to basically be a replacement for needing a graphics card, so technically if you have an APU in your system, you don't need to buy a separate uh, dedicated graphics card. So what is a core and a thread? Because like I said, that's something that's important to look at when you're choosing a CPU. So I wanna make this analogy so that you guys like actually understand what it is. So a core is like a working person. So in this analogy, I'm just gonna use a fast food restaurant because I think uh, comparing the two makes a lot of sense. So let's say, theoretically, right, at a fast food restaurant, you had one person doing everything, okay? That would probably take a while to get all the tasks done. You know, you'd have one, they'd be, you know, running back and forth between the registers and maybe in the back to do the cooking. So what's what's a solution to this problem? Well, a solution to this problem would be a hiring more people so that more people can do different tasks. If you have two or three or four people working, you can have uh, all the different people doing those different tasks and they'll get done much quicker than if you have one person running back and forth doing everything. So a core is like that working person. Uh, obviously, if you have more cores, uh, then uh, your CPU is usually capable of doing more at one time. However, I do want to mention something. Not all programs are built to use multiple cores. So if you're going to be buying a CPU, you want to look into the programs that you're going to be running and will they actually utilize all the cores. This is like having too many cooks in the kitchen. If we go back to our fast food example, remember if you have a, if you have a restaurant, yes, uh, uh, more people helps you up to a certain point, but if you have too many people, eventually it's not going to help you and in some cases it can actually hinder you. So you don't want to hire too many people, just the people, the amount people that'll get you the most uh, done at one time. Now thread counts, threads, are a little bit different from cores. They are kind of based on the cores, but a thread is more like how many tasks can be done at that one time, which means theoretically, okay, if we have six people doing a job, let's say we had in a restaurant, we had six people uh, working, and those six people could only do one thing at a time, okay? Now this would mean that essentially, uh, like maybe you have one person working the register and that's all they can do. They can only work the register. You have one person taking orders at the drive-thru and that's all they can do. They can only take orders at the drive-thru. You have one person, you know, uh, flipping burgers and that's all they can do is flip those burgers. However, let's say theoretically we upped the amount of tasks that uh, each person could do at once, okay? So we took one of those workers and we said, okay, instead of just taking orders of the drive-thru, you can also make drinks for the drive-thru. You can do two things at once. And we, let's say we did that for all the workers. All the workers can now all of a sudden do two things at once. That is increasing the thread count. You're not adding more people, but you're adding more tasks that p can be done at the same time, which overall improves efficiency and uh, improves performance. Now, it might not improve performance as much as just adding more people. For example, if you had two people, right? If you had two people, 
one dedicated to just taking orders at the drive-thru, and one dedicated to just making drinks. Those two people are probably going to get the job done quicker than if you have one person taking orders and making drinks. But with that being said, one person taking orders and making drinks at the same time is still going to be a lot faster than uh, one person who has to take the orders and then you ha uh, they have to make the drinks completely separately. They can't do them at the same time. Okay. So that goes into SMT and hyperthreading. SMT stands for simultaneous multi-threading. Hyperthreading is basically Intel's version of SMT, which is basically where you take uh, a CPU and you take its cores, and usually you basically double the uh, uh, the core count for the actual thread count. So that means that each core, once again, can do two simultaneous tasks. Uh, it, it means that if you have a six core CPU, you might actually have 12 threads, which means you can do 12 tasks at once. Now there are exceptions to this rule. There are versions of SMT, a very few that it isn't just as simple as doubling the core count. But for our purposes in this club, uh, just generally, I want you guys to, you know, usually think that it's doubling the core count. Once again, very few exceptions. They do exist, but for the most part, it's just doubling. So if you have four cores with hyperthreading, that would usually mean you have four cores and eight threads. Next up, I wanna talk about the architecture just real quick. So newer CPUs tend to have better architecture. That's kind of the point of releasing new generations. Uh, what does a newer architecture actually mean though? Uh, this means that the processor is going to be more efficient with what it has. Uh, now, if you think about this efficiency, what does, what does that mean? It means, you're going to be using less power and you're going to be getting more performance. And if you have less power, you actually have less heat produced. Because what heat really is, is it's energy that's being consumed, but not actually being utilized properly. So it just turns into heat and goes into your computer case. And then obviously we have to get rid of that heat somehow uh, because it's just leftover energy that you don't need. Now, this also goes into what I mentioned earlier, instructions per cycle, aka IPC, aka instructions per clock. Well, IPC is what's uh, what I call a comparative value. It's not something that's quantitative. It does not have an actual number. I can't take a CPU and say, this CPU has five IPC. IPC is basically saying how efficient the architecture is uh, relative to other CPU architectures. So maybe uh, I have an Intel CPU. Let's just take a random generation. Let's say I have an eighth generation CPU. Uh, and then I have a ninth generation CPU. Now these are gonna be made up numbers. They're not gonna be real, but I'm just using them for example. Let's say Intel goes out and claims, they might say our ninth generation processors have 15% better IPC than our eighth generation processors. What they're saying there is that they're, uh, the IPC on the ninth gen chips are 15% more efficient. And so theoretically with the same specs, you should be getting about 15% more performance uh, uh, than the over the eighth gen processors. Now, obviously they don't actually have the exact same specs. So there's gonna be a lot of differences between the two other than just the IPC, but for a comparison of just IPC, that's basically what's going on. Now this explains why a lot of uh, processors uh, actually on paper, they look way less powerful than other processors, especially older processors. For example, you might have a, uh, uh, an older FX series chip that has like eight cores or really high frequency, but then it's easily beaten by like a modern like Intel Core i3 with way less cores and lower clock speeds. That's because the architecture has been improved over time and it has a lot better IPC. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So next up we have the frequency guys, and this also gets into overclocking. So like I mentioned earlier, the frequency is sometimes uh, called the speed. It's actually the cycles per second, which is because it's measured in gigahertz. So for any of you like physics geeks out there, like I'm sure you've done a lot of uh, math on frequencies and stuff. So does greater frequency always mean better performance in a processor? And the answer is no. And that goes with what I mentioned earlier about the IPC, about the architecture, about the other specs. Uh, you might have a, you know, a processor could be clocked at 5 gigahertz, but it might perform worse than a processor clocked at 4 gigahertz because maybe the processor at 4 gigahertz has other specs that are different. Maybe it has more cores and threads. Maybe it has a better architecture, a better IPC, etc. So just looking at the frequency alone uh, does not tell you uh, how good the processor is going to perform. It doesn't even tell you the uh, single core speed, even if you're just comparing core to core, because once again, you might have a better architecture on one CPU than the other.
However, with that being said, if all of the uh, factors are the same, you have the same IPC, maybe you have two specific chips that are actually the same chip, and one's clocked higher than the other, you're probably going to get better performance, which is how we get into overclocking. Now what overclocking is doing is basically you're going to uh, force your CPU to run at an increased voltage so that it can then also run at a higher clock speed and get more performance. And there's also a, an opposite to overclocking called undervolting, where you're doing the exact opposite. Uh, you're decreasing the voltage and making it run at a lower clock speed. A lot of times that's done in like laptops in order to improve the cooling performance. Because I want you to think about this for a second. If you're overclocking, if you're, if you're increasing the voltage and the frequency, what does that mean? It means that you're going to be using more energy for the CPU, and if you have more energy, no matter what, there are going to be inefficiencies, so more of that energy is going to be end, end up transferring into heat energy, and then you're going to have to cool that off. So something I want you to keep in mind if you're going to overclock, uh, you're probably going to have to get a cooling solution that can actually handle it, okay? Keep that in mind. Speaking of cooling that, now we have the CPU cooler. So this sounds really, really obvious, guys. Like, what does the CPU cooler do? Well, it cools the CPU. Uh, uh, it's all that unused energy that leads to heat production. And one easy way to like kind of figure out, okay, what, what type of CPU cooler do I want to look at is to look at the total power draw, uh, also referred to as TDP, uh, of the uh, CPU. Now, higher wattage components, guys, you're going to need better cooling. And all components are going to have these TDP values, where basically shows you the wattage they're expected to use. Once again, more wattage equals more energy, more energy equals more heat. Now, another important thing to look at with a CPU is the thermal paste. Uh, and you need to make sure that you actually apply the thermal paste if it's not already pre-applied. Some coolers will come with it pre-applied and some won't. Some will come with it in a, in a tube that you have to put out yourself. Now, thermal paste, it looks actually a lot like toothpaste, but it's just gray. And essentially what it does is, so between your CPU, the, the top of your CPU, uh, which is called the IHS, and the bottom of your CPU cooler, you're basically putting two pieces of metal directly on top of each other and hoping that the heat will transfer from the CPU to the CPU cooler and then uh, be blown away outside of the case. However, if you were to look at uh, your CPU and your CPU cooler, it would look pretty like straight on the top and bottom of the CPU uh, of the CPU and CPU cooler. However, if you were to take a microscope and you were to look at it, all of a sudden you'd see a ton of ridges and bumps and potholes and stuff like that. All these microscopic bubbles or gaps that would just be air. And quite frankly, heat doesn't really transfer through air very well. So what that means is that we need something to fill those gaps of air that actually does transfer heat pretty well. And that's the purpose of thermal paste. You put a little bit of thermal paste on top of the CPU so that it fills those microscopic gaps, allowing heat to transfer no matter what, even if it's through uh, that, uh, even if it's uh, even if it's just to close up the gaps between the uh, CPU and CPU cooler. Now, a huge uh, factor of all cooling, uh, no matter what type of cooling you have is surface area guys so i don't know if you can see in the picture look at the picture that's on the screen right now do you see how there's the fan and then behind the fan you see there's a ton of little lines uh like like a lot of them now that's actually to uh make a higher surface area behind uh the fan on the cpu cooler itself now if you go back to like chemistry or once again physics or anything you know reactions take place much quicker if you increase the surface area because there's more area for you know everything to react. Now, a CPU cooler works in a very similar way. Uh, more surface area means that there's more area for the air to basically take the, uh, like the heat to go into the air and be blown out. So adding more surface area to a CPU cooler, guys, is going to basically increase the uh, cooling performance, which is why when we look at some actual CPU coolers in just a second, you'll see there is a lot, a ton of like skinny, fi uh, what's called fins, and they're called, it, it, they call it a fin stack. Uh, stacked onto most air coolers and liquid coolers. They have them inside the radiators. So that gets into uh, liquid and air, and I'm going to go to the next slide because I actually have a picture of uh, an air cooler and a liquid cooler, so I can point out some of the differences. So on our left is an air cooler by Be Quiet, and on our right is a liquid cooler by Corsair. Now, if we look at the Be Quiet cooler, it's, once again, it's an air cooler. You can see that there's heat pipes, a fan, and then you see that giant fin stack. And once again, there's a ton of really thin fins that are supposed to be stacked very, uh, very tightly on top of each other so that uh, there's as much surface area as possible. And that's basically how the CPU cooler works. Uh, 
uh, for an air cooler is it's just taking that heat, hoping that that heat transfers from the CPU to the metal in the CPU cooler, and then the metal uh, transfers from that metal to the fin stack through the heat pipes, and then the air is blown away and hopefully out of the case because you don't just want endless heat building up in your case because eventually, you know, that could do harm to some of your uh, PC components. You want to expel that heat out outside so that everything stays nice and cool. Now, if we look to our right, we see the CPU cooler. CPU cooler is a little bit different. Uh, basically, what you have is you can see right at the front of the picture, that's actually a pump. Uh, and that pump basically sits on the CPU. Underneath it, there is like a little uh, block that sits a uh, metal block that sits on the CPU itself. Now, what the what the CPU what the liquid cooler is doing is you see those tubes. There's actually water running through those tubes. And instead of transferring the uh, heat just to like the metal pipes, you're actually transferring the heat to the water. Now the water then goes around and it goes into what's called a radiator. Uh, the radiator is the, is the uh, little block you see that the CPU is screwed into. Now that radiator, once again, has surface area in it. It's basically the water is going to be going through a ton of tiny little tubes, and uh, that fan's going to blow the heat, try to blow the heat out of the water and outside of the case once again, hopefully. Uh, now what this means is that, uh, once again, we'll be dispelling the uh, heat outside of the cooler, and we'll actually be doing this through water. So. One major benefit of water, once again, if you go to any science class you've taken, uh, water has a very large heat capacity or specific heat, depending on what you've heard. Now, what heat capacity or specific heat is, is how much energy does it take to actually like increase the temperature of a substance, right? Uh, now, water, which has a very, very large heat capacity compared to most things, that means it's going to take a lot of energy to actually heat up this water compared to like just a piece of metal, which what this means in turn is it's gonna take a long time for the CPU to become quote unquote heat soaked, which is basically where the CPU cooler itself is so hot that it's having a hard time cooling off the CPU because it's basically already like almost as hot as the CPU. So with air coolers, you might have this issue where it becomes heat soaked and all of a sudden you see your temperatures are slowly, slowly, slowly rising over time um, because uh, while at the beginning the CPU cooler was cool and it was able to fully effectively cool the CPU, maybe uh, it got heat soaked, now the fins are all hot, so it's taking a while longer. You're basically just hoping the fan can blow it off as fast as it can, but it can only do so much. With a, with a liquid cooler, this takes a much longer time to actually happen because the water is effective at taking in that energy, and it, it's effective at making sure that even if it takes in a lot of energy, it doesn't heat up as much. So I want you guys to keep that in mind. So now here we have the uh, motherboard. The motherboard, uh, if the CPU is like the brain, the motherboard is often referred to as the heart of the PC. This is because uh, everything, and I mean everything, is going to be connected to the motherboard in some way, shape, or form. Now on the motherboard, you have a little piece of software called the BIOS. The BIOS is basically the only thing that comes pre-installed when you first build a PC. You don't have Windows or Linux or Mac OS just magically on your PC after you build it, you actually need to install that yourself later on. But the BIOS will come with the motherboard, and this is basically a little piece of software, it's very basic, that allows you to, uh, you know, configure a lot of basic settings and actually, you know, boot your PC up and uh, select a boot device so you can later install an operating system and also control a lot of basic features like, overclo like overclocking and uh, fan speed, stuff like that. Uh, we also have the CMOS battery on the motherboard. Now let's see if I can get my mouse to show up. Yes, you can. So the CMOS battery is right here. And if you guys think it looks like a watch battery, that's because it basically is a watch battery. In fact, yes, it is a watch battery. Now what this CMOS battery does, keep in mind, there are a lot of settings on your motherboard that, you know, uh, you want them to be stored 24 seven. For example, the date and time. Even if your system turns off, you don't want your date and time to just randomly be changed or, or randomly be wiped. You want that still, you know, existing. So that's why uh, the CMOS battery is here, is to store, store a lot of these uh, uh, date and time and small other settings that you always need, even if the system is off stored. Uh, it just provides the power just to do that. Now, another big thing with the CMOS battery uh, it, the CMOS battery is also what allows uh, your system to store some of its overclocking settings. For example, like if you set certain voltages or something, which means that if the CMOS, if the CMOS battery stores that, think about this. Let's say you overclock and you mess up. You mess up really bad. Uh, 
then what you can do is sometimes you can just take out the CMOS battery to clear the CMOS and maybe the uh, overclocking settings might be reverted. Now, this is not always the case. It's not a 100% fix, but it is something that's good to try if you mess something up in the software and you wanna try fixing it real quick. Now, some other boards, uh, they actually have dedicated buttons to clear the CMOS on them. Some other boards have uh, just a set of pins to clear the CMOS that you have to bridge. Now, what's bridging pins? That sounds a little complicated. It's really not. You basically take a screwdriver and you touch the end of the screwdriver to the two pins, it bridges them because the screwdriver is a piece of metal. So yeah, and I'm not 100% sure on this board, but these two pins right here might actually do that. Uh, I could be completely wrong, I haven't looked at the manual or anything, but if I had to guess, since it's so close and those are two pins right there, it might be right there. Um, with that being said, this is an audio line right here, so might might not be the case. But anyways, uh, another way to clear the CMOS if you can't find those pins or if you don't have a button is to just take this uh, battery out. This little latch right here, you can press in and the battery should pop right out. Now, another important thing with the motherboards is the chipset. Now, the chipset is relocated right here where I'm circling around. And yes, on top of that, that is like a miniature heat sink basically for it. Now, the chipset is very, very important, guys, because it determines a lot of the feature features your motherboard is able to have. Uh, it determines what CPU your motherboard is compatible with, which is also determined by the socket up here. Uh, it determines uh, what what overclockability you have. Some chipsets, they won't even let you overclock, while others will. So if you're planning to overclock, you need to get a motherboard with that overclockability. It determines how many PCIe lanes you have, which we'll talk about in just a second. And it determines like me memory speeds in some cases, stuff like that. So it determines a lot of basic uh, features of the motherboard. And if you get a, a chipset that's far too cheap, then maybe you won't have some features that you wanted to use. And you gotta look at look into what, what are you planning to do will determine what chipset you wanna buy. Now chipsets are also usually named really weirdly. They usually have one letter at the beginning and then they have a few numbers. And basically each CPU lineup usually has like a few main chipsets. So like for example, for this motherboard right here, uh, which is made for LGA, the LGA 1200, uh, 12XX socket, you have, this is a Z490, uh, a Z490 board, so it has the Z490 chipset. Um, with that being said, uh, the, the Z490 chipset is an example of a chipset that does include like overclocking features that is a flagship chipset, but not all of them are the case. Now, if we look right here, right, we also have written uh, uh, lots of different connections on the motherboard, which I'm gonna go over in a second with a larger picture of a motherboard. You also have the VRMs, which the VRM and power delivery setup is all up here near the CPU. Now, VRM stands for Voltage Reg Regulator Module. It's what's making sure that your CPU is actually being fed the correct voltage. So obviously, if you have bad VRMs, then you know they might not be capable at feeding your CPU the correct voltage, and if they start to mess up because your CPU wants more power than they can handle, then you know that can potentially create a lot of issues. You want to make sure to get a good motherboard uh, with good VRMs, especially if you're doing overclocking, and you want to make sure you get a motherboard with VRMs that can you know actually handle uh, your CPU. Now, a good way to do this, uh, you can actually Google online. There are a lot of uh, tier lists for motherboards. Just make sure that whatever tier list that you're using actually has like legitimate sources and stuff to like show that they've really done the tests. Uh, and you can usually find, like you can look at the setups, uh, how many VRMs there are, uh, if it has a VRM for the, like how many VRMs for the SOC, which is the system on chip, which is something else that gets a little complicated that we're not gonna go into. You can look up a lot of things, okay, for the VRMs and figure out whether the motherboard has good VRMs or not. Uh, but once again, just make sure that you get one that can handle your CPU. There have been motherboards that have exploded in the past due to bad VRMs with um, very like power heavy CPUs. Now we also have three main form factors for uh, uh, your motherboard, uh, ATX, micro ATX, and mini ITX. And I'll also talk about those with some, uh, a picture I have later on. Finally, your motherboard does basically uh, determine a lot of your upgradability. For example, let's say you wanted to add like a second graphics card on, you have to make sure your motherboard has at least two PCIe slots, which once again, we'll talk about soon. Or let's say you wanted to, uh, let's say you had two sticks of RAM and uh, you wanted to add another two later down the line, 
You got to make sure that you have four RAM slots. Uh, it determines your CB, what CPUs you can put in it. A lot of stuff like that. So a lot of the upgradability is determined by the motherboard. So now I have two uh, pictures of the same motherboard just from different angles here. And I want to just take some time to just like show you guys uh, some of the different parts on a motherboard, okay? So first of all, if we look at this picture to the right, you can see that your back I.O. is actually determined by the motherboard. So if you look at the back of like any desktop, you always have this sort of section where it has a lot of USB ports and stuff. Uh, your audio jacks, uh, your ethernet. This is actually a PS2 port right here, really old mouse and keyboard port some display ports if you have integrated graphics, et cetera. So that's all gonna be determined by your motherboard. Some higher end motherboards have uh, really nice IO sections, whereas some lower end don't. You also have right here, this middle section. This is your CPU socket where you're going to install your CPU. Now these brackets right here, uh, these two brackets, you can see there's one above and one below the CPU. Uh, I said that out of order, I don't know why, but uh, th those are for attaching CPU coolers, and you can actually take off this bracket to attach some CPU coolers. All CPU coolers are kind of different, so there's not really one way for me to just tell you this is how you install the CPU cooler. You kind of usually just have to read the manual and figure it out, but it's usually not too difficult. But once again, you would use uh, this area right here to do so. Right here, these slots are RAM slots. Uh, they're also called DIMM slots in a lot of scenarios. Uh, you install all of your memory or RAM here, uh, right here, this is uh, for your CPU power, which we'll talk more about when we get into power supplies in a moment. Uh, here, these are CPU fan headers. Uh, some of them, uh, you don't have to plug, a, one of them is probably dedicated for the CPU fan, and then the other two are probably CPU fan optional, or they can just be normal fans, but these four pin headers uh, are fan headers. Now, fa fan headers have two types. They have four pin and three pin. Four pin basically means they have this thing called PWM, uh, which basically means you can control them through software, whereas a three pin you can only really control by like actually like changing the voltage and it's not really actually controllable at all. Uh, here, this big connector right here, you connect your motherboard power, which once again is a power supply connection we'll talk about later. This port right here, that's a USB uh, type C header uh, for if you have a USB type C on your case. Now, if you see these holes right here, you can see one right here, one right here, one right here. One right here, that's where you actually are able to screw in your motherboard to the case. Now, if you look at uh, right here, you have your chipset on this motherboard, and this chipset actually even has its own little fan. Once again, every motherboard will have a chipset somewhere. Uh, now, if you look right here, this slot right here with the little screw holes, and also right here, this heatsink looking thing, those are where M.2 slots are. Uh, a lot of times M.2 slots will have heat sinks over them because M. some modern M.2 drives can get very hot and don't worry, we will talk about those when we're talking about storage. Uh, these longer slots right here, you can see there's quite a few of them and then there's some shorter ones. Those are PCIe slots. Now, PCIe slots you can actually put a lot of things into, uh, you, but the main, the main object that you're like always putting into a PCIe slot is a, usually a graphics card, but graphics card is not the only thing you can put in a PCIe slot. Oftentimes you can have uh, Wi-Fi cards being put in these, uh, sometimes storage drives, which we'll also talk about later, uh, etc. So, and even some PCs like have like sound cards and stuff. So keep that in mind. Uh, the PCIe slots, uh, a lot of things connect for them, but for this lecture, I, I would like you guys to know that this is always where you're gonna put in your graphics card. Now down here, we have all these tiny little connections. I understand that these connections, they look very, very daunting. Uh, so like right here we have more CPU, or not CPU, just fan he fan headers in general. This little white port right here is, I believe, an addressable RGB header. I can't really tell 100% if it's addressable or non-addressable, but I'm pretty sure that is addressable. So an addressable, you can tell if it is one because it'll basically have one of these pins knocked out. It'll only have three, whereas a non-addressable RGB header will have four. Um, Actually, yeah, if I look right there, it does actually say at the bottom ADD. So yeah, I can almost confirm that that is a, an addressable RGB header. Now here's uh, probably where you're going to be plugging in uh, a lot of your front IO header uh, connections. So like your power switch, your uh, uh, 
your hard drive activity LED. A lot of, uh, basically your case will have all these connections. Like your case might have, you know, USB ports, uh, the power button, the reset switch, all of that stuff you're gonna be connecting in these bottom ports over here. So they look really, really daunting, but it's, it's really not that bad when you memorize them. So like, uh, some of these are like, uh, where you connect, uh, if you have like HD audio, you might have a, a microphone and headphone jack on your case. USB ports uh, are connected uh, like right over here, uh, USB 2.0s at least, and then this is a USB 3.0 header, if you have USB 3.0. Uh, you also have, uh, you know, like I said, you usually have some LEDs or activity lights that you'll connect to down here, etc. So these, uh, they look really, really complicated. And at first, a lot of people, when they first look at like the motherboards, they're really scared. They're like, oh, that's a lot of pins. I don't want to touch them. But really, when you get used to them, there's only a few that you have to uh, connect. And when you just do them in order, it's not that bad. So then right here, you have uh, SATA ports. SATA ports are used to connect various storage devices that are used using SATA, using a SATA data cable. Uh, and we'll get into that more later as well. And... Yeah, that's basically all the major things. Over here, you have like some of your audio stuff, little audio line divider uh, thing right here. Uh, and there's nothing else I think that's like super duper important to memorize. If you guys have any questions on anything on a motherboard, feel free to just, you know, message me. So more motherboard stuff. I did mention form factors earlier. So if we look at this motherboard, this motherboard, and this motherboard, okay? we can see like there are kind of like the, uh, the major difference between the three is how physically large they are this is a these are all different form factors which are standardized so what that means is that basically uh, your motherboard has a size that then correlates to your case which also has sizes now how it works is basically if we have a motherboard and we have a case the motherboard has to be a uh, equal to the case or smaller. So on the left, we have what's called ATX, which is the largest main motherboard size. There are larger such as EATX, but for our you know mainstream applications, this is gonna be the largest size, just normal ATX. And then in the middle, we have a micro ATX motherboard. And to the right, we have a mini ITX motherboard. Now, once again, your motherboard must be at least uh, it must be equal to then equal to uh, or less than the size of your case. So, for example, let's say you have a micro ATX case. You could put a micro ATX motherboard in it, or you could put a mini ATX motherboard in it. You could not fit an ATX motherboard in a micro ATX case. And once again, these sizes are all standardized. So, like you can put most motherboards in most cases as long as this, uh, as long as they support the size. And this is also like you know you can it'll determine like how you screw in the motherboard to the case depending on where the placements of the, uh, the little holes here are for the standoffs and screws. So keep that in mind. Next up, we have memory or RAM. Now, this uh, stands for random access memory. It's like, I feel like knowing that RAM stands for random access memory is like one of those facts that like just everyone knows. It's like similar to like knowing the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell in science, right? Like everybody's heard it before. I want to mention uh, specifically for like normal memory, it's actually referred to as, D, as DRAM and the D stands for dynamic. The reason I specify this is because your graphics card also has its own memory called VRAM. So I just want to make that distinction there. Uh, memory also has speed, just, just like the CPU. Your memory speed is, uh, you know, it's usually measured in megahertz actually though instead of gigahertz, which is a little weird. I don't know why companies like originally decided to do this. Like your CPU, like an example would be like, somebody might say my CPU is running at 4.5 gigahertz. For memory, somebody's gonna say my CPU is running at 3200 megahertz, okay. Uh, your memory can be overclocked to just like your CPU. And once again, this can lead to an increase in performance. Uh, heat on memory is not really as big of an issue as it is for a CPU because it's not drawing as much power in the first place. But uh, one possible overclocking setting is just setting this to your memory to what's called XMP, which is basically going to try to get your memory to run at its rated speed. 
Now, what do I mean by rated speed? Okay, your memory has a rated speed. So for example, you might buy a kit that says it's rated for 3000 megahertz, but actually the stock speed setting of like all DDR4 is 2133 megahertz. So if you don't go in and at least set your memory in the BIOS, you have to go into your motherboard's BIOS and set it to 3000 megahertz. It's gonna be sitting there running at 2133. Now, another thing to look at uh, are the latencies. Uh, there are four latencies. You'll see them all lined up in a row. And the most commonly referred to one is the cast latency, which is the first latency. So once again, you'll see this, you'll see like a ton of numbers. Like you might see like 16, 16, 16, 39 or something. Uh, and typically, basically what it is, is your lower latency is better. Now this makes sense because uh, if you have lower latency, you know, what is a latency? Latency is a time that it's taking for something, uh, for something to communicate something which means that if you have a lower latency, you're spending less time communicating and you know you have better overall performance. I'm not gonna go into the specifics on the latencies. I don't need you guys to memorize exactly what they are. I just need to know you guys to know that uh, lower latencies is typically better. Although there are more aspects to memory, which we'll go over later in the club, like the memory controllers and how they actually communicate with the CPU and all of that stuff. But for now, just know that typically you want higher speed, lower latency. So like, a 3000 megahertz kit running at a cast latency of let's say 16 uh, will be better than like a 2133 megahertz kit running at a cast, cast latency of like 19 or something, if that makes sense. Next up we have storage. So uh, if your RAM is storing like all of your temporary, uh, uh, I actually forgot to mention this. Let me go back to memory. Your memory is gonna store stuff that's temporary data, data that's like short term. So I, I like making this comparison here. Uh, your storage uh, is gonna be like your long term, like a storage cabinet, whereas your RAM is like, if you have like a table in front of you to put your tools on, you can really quickly access the table and the table is gonna let you do more at one time, but the storage cabinet is where you're gonna put most of the th uh, things that you're not using or uh, you know most of your ma mass uh, data essentially. So if we look at a storage drive here, um, we got three main types of storage that are going to be important to know. We have hard drives, SATA SSDs, or SATA, however you want to pronounce it. SATA SSDs come in both SATA or M.2 form factors. And then we also have NVMe SSDs in the M.2 form factor and PCIe SSDs uh, that connect through a PCIe slot. Now, typically hard drives are the slowest, SATA SSDs are the middle grounds, and NVMe SSDs and PCIe SSDs are the fastest. There are also multiple generations of NVMe nowadays. Uh, the most common generations are Generation 3 and Generation 4. A Gen 3 drive will re typically, a good Gen 3 drive will typically run around 3,000 megabits per second, whereas a good Gen 4 drive will run like easily over 5,000, so keep that in mind. Now, the, the real world performance does not really live up to those uh, theoretical speeds, unfortunately, but that is just a statistic just to know. Uh, now, what is a boot drive, guys? What is a boot drive? Okay, is it a drive that's shaped like a boot? Uh, no, that's not the case. Um, a boot drive is the drive that you're booting off of. It's the drive that your operating system is installed on. Now, if you install your operating system on a very slow drive, like a hard drive, it means that your computer is going to end up taking like 10 minutes just to turn on, whereas you install your operating system on an NVMe drive or a PCIe drive, or even a SATA SSD is usually very fast, it shouldn't take super long to turn on, to boot up, to get everything running and loading. So this means that basically in 2022, I'm going to always recommend that your boot drive be some form of SSD. It can be a SATA SSD, an NVMe SSD, a PCIe SSD, although PCIe SSDs are pretty uncommon nowadays, but do not ever in 2022 build a system where you're booting off a hard drive. It is simply not worth it. What I recommend doing, especially because prices are going down anyways, at least get a SAT SSD. And even if it's a smaller SAT SSD, you can always add on a hard drive later when you actually need the storage space. But please, please always boot off of an SSD. Uh, you do not want to be booting off of a hard drive in 2022. Now, something I wanted to mention just real quick, but I'm not going to dive super deep into is RAID configurations. Uh, RAID configurations is basically having your drives work together to get more performance or maybe more longevity. Uh, so for example, you might have two drives basically saving the same data so that if one drive fails, uh, you have, uh, you know, you, you still have a copy of the data and you're not kind of screwed over. Uh, you could also have like two drives 
basically like if you're saving one piece of data, you might have one drive saving half the data and the other drive saving the other half of the data. So they're working together and they're actually getting the job done quicker. Now there are caveats to both. For example, if you have two drives saving the same data, it means that you need double the storage in order to do that, uh, which is gonna cost more. If you have two drives uh, working together and like one drive is saving half the data and, one, and another drive is saving the other half, Yes, you'll have faster drive performance overall, but it means that if one drive fails, uh, it, your data is just gone. You can't have half the data is just still there. It's gonna be corrupted and you're not going to have access to that anymore. So keep that in mind when you're doing RAID. Once again, not super important. In fact, RAID's actually be also becoming pretty dated, especially because SSDs are becoming much cheaper. So a lot of times you can get the same effect out of just buying one SSD uh, versus doing like RAID configurations with hard drives, but it is still something I wanted to mention. So here are some SATA SSDs. So uh, SATA SSDs are gonna, like I said, they're gonna be in the middle the middle grounds. Uh, and you can see this is what a SATA SSD with the SATA, SATA interface looks like. And this is what a SATA SSD with the M.2 interface looks like. Now, for M.2 drives, I want you guys to think about M.2 drives. They're about the size of a stick of a piece of gum, like a piece of extra gum. Uh, that's literally how small they are. When I first got an M.2 drive, I looked at this size and I was like, wow, that's like way smaller than I thought it would be. But just know that sometimes these drives, they are referred to as like gum drives or gum stick drives. Now we have NVMe SSDs and PCIe SSDs. So to, the, to our left, this is a PCIe SSD that's going to be plugged in one of those PCIe slots that we talked about earlier on the motherboard. And to our right, we have uh, an M.2 NVMe SSD. So now you might be wondering, Wait a second, whoa, 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 let's go back to the SAT SSDs. Let's go back to the NVMe SSDs. Chris, 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 hold up, man. What is the difference between this NVMe SSD and this uh, SAT SSD? Like, they look pretty similar. So I want you to look at the connector right here, okay? Now, if you see this connector, see how there's two slots, and you see how right here, there's only one little slot. Now, this is the case for probably like 95, maybe even higher percentage of drives. There are ex exceptions to this rule, but you can use this rule pretty much all the time. If there's one slot, it's usually an NVMe SSD, which means it is the faster drive. And if there's two slots, uh, it's usually a SATA drive. So it's, it's a slower of the two. Not that it's slow, it's just compared to an NVMe drive, it will be slow. Next up, we have the GPU, stands for Graphics Processing Unit, and uh, there are actually two companies involved in creating a GPU, uh, or actually, my bad, not a GPU, a graphics card. So something I want to say is a GPU and a graphics card are not the same thing. Oftentimes in the tech world, people refer to GPUs as graphics cards and graphics cards as GPUs. So the GPU is actually the physical chip on the graphics card. So GPU is part of a graphics card, but it's not the entire thing. The graphics card encompasses everything, including you know the cooler, the entire uh, PCB, which is actually the type of plastic that the board is made on. So it's basically the motherboard for the GPU is the PCB of it. Uh, and so I wanna go back to our worker analogy from the CPU that I was talking about earlier, in a, in a sense. So your GPU, like I said, it's graphics processing unit. So that sounds pretty similar to central processing unit. Is it a CPU? Not exactly. Okay. Uh, your graphics card, let's say uh, your CPU, we have, we, you might have like six cores, 12 threads. You know, you have basically your CPU is like a few smart people uh, working together in the, in the aspect of computer and, and technology. Your GPU, I imagine instead of having a few smart people working together, you have like millions, billions, or even trillions of like really stupid people working. And I know that might not be a good like uh, analogy to say, but let's know that these graphics cards, they're not stupid, but uh, compared to humans, but compared to the CPU, uh, an individual uh, uh, an individual core, you could say, is going to be very stupid because you might have, like I said, literally trillions of them. So what does this mean, guys? What does this mean? So if you have a CPU, you have a few smart people, Whereas if you have a GPU, you have like a million stupid people. All right, so take a task. Take a task. Let's say you have a math question, right? You have one really, really hard math question. Who's going to be better for the job? A few really smart people or like a million people who are like pretty stupid? Well, the answer is the few really smart people because it doesn't matter how many like below average people you have, they're probably not going to even be able to start the problem if it's a really, really hard problem. 
However, let's take the opposite scenario, okay? Let's say I give you a packet of a million problems to do, but they're all like really easy problems. Like you just got like, I don't know, add, add, but they're, they're super easy, but there's a million of them. Who's gonna get them done quicker? Uh, the millions of rather stupid people or the one really smart person or a few really smart people? The answer there is the millions of people who are, you know, smart or not smart. The millions of people who are actually stupider, but there's so many of them, so they're going to get that set of questions done quicker than a few really smart people. So that means that a GPU, uh, it's, it's responsible for a lot of actually the easier calculations for a PC. Now, what's quote unquote easier? Maybe doing geometry, okay? Geometry uh, might actually be simpler, a very simple task for a PC, which goes into like Graphics rendering, which goes into playing video games, photo editing, maybe even if you're streaming, you can have the GPU take care of the stream for you, stuff like that. Now, this isn't going to go into actually some of the things like when you're playing a game, actually it's the CPU doing all the physics calculations usually, and it's not really going to help you if you're like trying to like run a database or something, that's not something you need a graphics card for. But it is going to, once again, really determine a lot of your uh, gaming performance, which is why the GPU market is so big. And that's also why GPUs are so extensive right now, because they have so many uses. You can have them do a ton of math problems, and you can have them mine cryptocurrency, which is, you know, one of the reasons there's so much demand for them. You need them to play games, basically, stuff like that. And when the demand is super high, and you also have, like, uh, cryptocurrency booms and uh, scalpers and everything, the, the price of the graphics cards have gone extremely, extremely high right now. So unfortunately, it is really, really hard to get... Um, a graphics card but that's just kind of is how it is finally i wanted to mention technically uh, a, your graphics card is not always necessary you have an apu which has its basically own gpu on the cpu um so if you have like integrated graphics or something or uh maybe amd has their uh, integrated vega or whatever then you don't always technically need a graphics a dedicated graphics card but uh if you're gonna play games or something you probably do want one Now, for your case, uh, this is what's going to house all of your components. Uh, it's also going to determine your airflow, like where you, how many fans you can have, and also like, look at the front panel. Is the front panel like actually open, or is it completely closed? Like, you want a case with good airflow, otherwise it's going to be really hard for the CPU cooler to actually do its job. You know, you're putting a lot of high wattage components into a build, oftentimes, and you don't want a case that's going to restrict the airflow a ton. Uh, aesthetically speaking, that's all up to your own personal preference, but once again, the case is going to determine basically how your system looks. You know, do you have a window? Uh, do you not have a window? What color is it? Stuff like that. Uh, a quality case can make assembly much easier. What I mean by that is like, like for example, right here, this is where, if you remember back when we were looking at the motherboard, I talked about the I.O. being on the motherboard. You have what's called an I.O. shield that you have to put in right here. Uh, and sometimes it's built into the motherboard, sometimes it isn't, but it's basically like what covers those ports. So you're not just like looking at like an, like kind of like an empty set of ports and like letting dust in and stuff. Um, putting in this IO shield can be a really big pain. Uh, and also you need to do it before you put it into the motherboard. But if you have a nice case, uh, it's much less of a pain. Like a, a cheap case, it'll be very hard to put in the IO shield. Uh, a more uh, nicer quality case might be much, much easier. Uh, once again, the case, it must fit your motherboard form factor. The case must be at least as large as your motherboard. If your case is only smaller than your motherboard, then it's not going to fit. Uh, you can see like right here, there's all these little holes. Those line up with motherboard, the motherboard holes that we, I showed you earlier. You put standoffs and then you can screw in your motherboard. You also will have your front panel connections determined by your, your case. Uh, so this is like if you have, like once again, you might have a US, some USB headers, or not USB headers, USB ports. Uh, you, you'll probably have a power switch. You probably will have a reset switch, some form of LEDs, uh, etc. So all of that will be determined by the case. And, and this is like, you can see some of the connections right here, actually. These are what connect to all those ports like that were down low on the motherboard that I was showing you earlier. You also sometimes have fans included, but you can also add your own fans and it'll depend on the case whether or not they're included and how many. And finally, your case is going to determine a lot of your cable management. For example, if we look at this case right here, we have this little like brick 
type thing at the bottom. This is called a power supply shroud. It's meant to you know hide a lot of your power supply cables so you can't see them. Not all cases have this, and also like you'll have like the actual physical space in the back to uh, manage your cables determined by the case. So maybe if you're building a PC, especially if uh, like you haven't built many computers, it's definitely a good idea to look into a case that it's not going to be super duper hard to like actually manage everything and make sure everything's all neat and tidy on the inside. Next up, we have power supplies. Uh, so power supplies are very, very, very uh, complicated, to be honest. Like they're probably one of the most complicated parts in the in the PC. However, there are still some things I would like to point out. Uh, first of all, we got the wattage. Now the wattage uh, is is how much uh, power the power supply is uh, capable, not of providing because the power is being provided by the wall socket, but uh, of converting. Uh, now, you need to make sure that your power supply's wattage is at least as high as how much the maximum wattage that your PC is going to use. In fact, I recommend getting it a little bit higher because, you know, you always want some headroom. Maybe you want to overclock or maybe you just don't always want to be running your power supply at 100% usage. Uh, for power supplies, you have what's called efficiency ratings. Uh, they're made by a company called 80 Plus. Now, these efficiency ratings are basically saying, well, how efficient the power supply is. What does that mean? Let's say your system needs... 500 watts to run, uh, an inefficient power supply might actually be using, you know, 600 watts when you really only need 500. All that extra wattage, once again, is just going to be turned into heat, so you don't want extra wattage. Uh, a more efficient power supply will basically have the actual wattage being used be closer to the wattage that you need. So maybe if you have, once again, if we go to like that 500 watt, 600 watt, maybe a more efficient power supply when it has 500 watts, it's only using 530 watts. That makes sense, hopefully. The efficiency ratings are in tiers. Uh, the tier from lowest to highest goes white, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, titanium. Uh, the ones I want you guys to know, uh, gold is extremely common, bronze is extremely common, titanium is the highest, and white, typically white power, white rated power supplies. It's not that the power supply rating itself is what makes the power supply bad, but if a company is putting a white rating on the power supply, uh, they're really cheaping out on it essentially, so they're probably also cheaping out on other things, so keep that in mind. Uh, I don't really typically recommend white rated power supplies, get at least a bronze. Now efficiency ratings also go along with the efficiency curves, that is, a power supply will essentially have uh, different efficiencies depending on how many watts it's pull pulling and at what percentage of watts out of the total watts it can pull it is pulling. So like, for example, a power supply that is 750 watts, like this power supply in the picture, uh, it might be like 90% efficiency when it's pulling, you know, uh, 500 watts, but maybe if it's pulling like 700 watts, it's only like 85% efficiency, okay? I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense for the point of this lecture, but what basically what I'm saying is uh, a singular power supply will have like a curve. It'll be like a graph, and at different wattages, it'll actually have different uh, per uh, percent efficiencies. Now, typically, a, a common rule for efficiency is a power supply is most efficient when it's being 50% utilized. So, like, for example, for this 750-watt power supply, uh, it might be most efficient when the system's actually pulling 375 watts. Now, that's just a, a, a random example. I'm not saying that this is actually the case for this specific unit. And also that 50% is an average. It's, it's a general rule. It's not the case for every power supply. You know, you might have some power supplies that are, you know, around 30 to 40. And you might have some power supplies that are most efficient at around 70 to 80% usage. It just depends on the specific unit. Once again, that is an average. Uh, your power supply will also control your modularity. Now, modularity is, uh, we can see right here, it's basically, uh, are the cables physically attached to the power supply or are there basically connections where you attach the cables yourself? Uh, if, you, if you can attach the cables yourself, it is a modular power supply. If you can't attach the cables yourself, uh, if they're already pre-connected and you can't remove them, it's non-modular. There are also power supplies that are called semi-modular where it's like some of them are always permanently attached and some of them you have a choice to attach yourself. Now, uh, I want you to keep in mind that if you have a modular power supply, it's oftentimes much nicer because that means you only have to use the cables that you actually need. Like, you aren't going to need every single one of these ports, you aren't going to need every single one of these cables for most PC builds. Uh, 
but they're all different uh, cables that you might need for different scenarios. So if you have a modular power supply, you only have to use the cables that you actually need. Whereas if you have a non-modular power supply and they're all like actually physically connected, even if you don't need a cable, it's still gonna have to be sitting in your PC because there's no way to detach it. Now, something a lot of people confuse is they confuse efficiency or modularity or anything. They confuse that with reliability. Reliability of a PSU is not determined by its efficiency or modularity or anything. They're completely separate factors. And I'm not going to get too into the re uh, reliability of specific power supplies because, once again, that gets really, really complicated and that goes beyond the scope of this club at the moment. But something I want you guys to look into is uh, there is a group called the PSU Cultists. Now I get it. Name sounds kind of crazy. But they are a legitimate group. There's a group called the PSU Cultists led by a guy named Luke Savanji or Sav Savanji. Uh, sorry if I pronounce that wrong, Luke. But uh, I, I talked to Luke and I asked him if I could basically shout out his uh, group for this lecture. And he said, sure, go right ahead and share his tier list. Uh, his tier list is extremely, extremely good. They do a lot of testing uh, on this stuff. And they do real testing. And basically, if you go to this tier list, they have the power supplies like rated for how reliable they actually are. And it's basically in order of like A, B, C, D, F. So it's like, you know, an F tier PSU would be very, very bad. Do not buy. An A tier would be very, very good, uh, etc. So I, I really recommend when you guys get a PSU, try to get one that's at least B tier. Technically, it's not necessary, but I just say, like, as a general rule of thumb, whenever I'm recommending parts to somebody, I always go with at least a B tier. I always check this PSU tier list. And especially for those beginners who, like, you don't really want to, like, get into the specifics of every power supply, just going to this tier list and looking at the, uh, you know, the, the tier will help you find out its reliability without having to get super duper into it. Uh, let's see. Then we also have uh, Cybernetics, which is basically a website that also has other types of certifications. And then finally, we have uh, OEM manufacturers versus brands. Now, not all brands of power supplies are actually making their own units. For example, this Corsair unit right here, I'm not sure about this specific unit, but like oftentimes Corsair actually takes power supplies from Seasonic, which is another company, and they basically rebrand re them, you know, add some bells and whistles, make, them, make it the power supply kind of their own, and then boom, it's a Corsair power supply. Basically, an OEM manufacturer is a company that actually makes the actual PSU unit, whereas uh, a brand is a company that takes those units that other companies make and they rebrand it as their own. So once again, uh, you got to know like just off the top, you don't have to know, you don't have to memorize any off the top of your head. Basically, an OEM is different from a brand. So here I have some pictures of uh, some of the different power supply cables. I just went on and got some like Google images of them real quick so I could show you guys. So right here, uh, this is a uh, SATA power cable. So if you remember when we were talking about SATA drives all the way back then, if you have a drive using a SATA interface, basically you need two cables. You need the SATA data cable, which is the cable that plugs into the motherboard, and you need the SATA power cable, which is a, a cable that will, if you like look at this end of this connector here, it'll plug into right over here. And then these connections will plug into drives, and they also sometimes power like LED headers and stuff like that. It's basically a power cable. Then right here, we have a four plus four pin. Now this is sometimes called an EPS power connector, and this is what actually powers the CPU. Here we have a uh, 6 plus 2 pin. And this is called the PCIe uh, connector sometimes. And this is what will power your graphics card and some other PCIe devices. Now I want you to look at this for a second, okay? This PCIe connector right here and this EPS or CPU uh, power supply connector right here. Notice they both have 8 pins, okay? So some people might like be like, okay, what if I tried plugging a CPU into like a GPU? Well, first of all, it's not going to work. I don't know if you guys can tell, but there's like actually different shapes. So you literally cannot plug one of these into the other. It's just not going to work. But second of all, just to always remember that a CPU will be a four plus four, even though it's eight, it's going to be two separate four pins. A for a graphics card or GPU, it's going to be six plus two. So it'll have eight total pins, but it'll be split into a six pin connector and a two pin connector, okay? Then up here we have a motherboard. Uh, uh, we have a motherboard connector. This will power your motherboard. It's the 24 pin. And then finally, 
down here we have uh, some Molex connectors. These are getting a little bit dated and they're very annoying. Uh, they perform a lot of the same functions as SATA power, just not as good to be honest. Like once again, they'll power like LED hubs and stuff like that, maybe some fan controllers, but they're very, very annoying. And uh, I'm hoping that eventually we don't ever use Molex again. I hope everything just uses SATA power. Still something I wanted to mention though. So that is all of the hardware components of a, uh, like that you are going to need when you build a PC uh, and a little bit about how to like actually, you know, choose them. If you guys have any questions on those, like feel free to ask me on Discord or whatever, I'm, I'm happy to answer. But also don't forget the OS, guys. You do have to install your operating system. Once again, the only thing that your PC is going to come with when you first build it is just the uh, BIOS on the motherboard. So if you want to install Windows or Linux or even if you want to make like a Hackintosh and install Mac OS or something, you're going to have to install that yourself. Keep that in mind. That also means that you'll have to install the drivers, which are basically pieces of software that work with the hardware, etc. Once again, we'll go over all of this in further detail later in the club, so don't worry. So I think that is all I have for today. Uh, I really hope that everyone enjoyed. Uh, I hope that if you didn't make it to the club meeting, uh, that you've learned a bit from this presentation. Maybe even if you are watching this after the, pre uh, uh, after the meeting that we had, just to reinforce some of the knowledge, uh, I hope that you guys all enjoyed and learned, and learned quite a bit. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and I'm looking forward to continuing to run the club this semester, and we do have some PC builds coming up by different people, some students, some professors, stuff like that. So thank you all, and goodbye.